Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the end of chapter two in our human geography textbook lectures. This is a shorter lecture. We have just a few sections left that I did not cover in the first lecture. There is a little bit of repetition as well, but that's okay because hopefully that will help cement some ideas or reinforce some of our learning. So let's get into it. I apologize for the poor resolution of a few of the graphics in this one. Uh, this part of the presentation, I used some of the textbooks graphics and not all of them are very high resolution and there weren't uh, high resolution immediately available that I could find. So uh, I'm gonna use these ones. I couldn't find uh, higher resolution uh, formats of these right away. And so I just went with the, these. Uh, I went back to the Our World and Data uh, excellent uh, maps when when they were available and charts when they were available. So our textbook goes into a few different measures of population density. And this is a really interesting thing to think about in terms of what a number or a statistic can mean in geography and how much meaning it might have versus how little it might mean. Uh, Population density can be measured as the number of people per square kilometer. As a matter of fact, that's a very common measure. You'll see lists of countries and very often they'll have their density listed like it's meaningful. I want to point out really quick that it is fairly meaningless because it doesn't tell us how people in a country actually live. And let me give you a really uh, prime example of that. Canada here is one of the least dense countries in terms of its arithmetic density, that is in terms of the number of people in the country divided by the total number of square kilometers in the country. It is here in this lowest category of less than 61 people per square kilometer, and it's much less than that. You can see there's places that are much denser, like the United States, that are still within that category. So Canada is one of the least dense places on Earth in terms of the number of people divided by the total amount of land area. But that implies then that, it, first of all, it does imply correctly that Canada is relatively full of empty space. So that's fair. But it also gives us ideas that maybe people in Canada don't live in cities, when in fact Canada's population is 80% plus urban. So most Canadians, an overwhelming majority of Canadians, live in cities in a relatively empty country. So the idea of Density as in a measure of a, an entire country is not very accurate. And in fact, you may have heard this as well. Um, a massive supermajority of the country lives um, in this southernmost part of the, of, the, of the country, very close to the American uh, border. So um, the, the majority of Canada's population is clustered here around the Great Lakes region um, in, in uh, southern Ontario and into Quebec. So uh, out the St. Lawrence Seaway as well. So the idea of population density telling us something about how people in the country live is not very good. And then in contrast, one of the most densely populated countries in the world, which is Bangladesh, again, measured in this arithmetic way, uh, people per square kilometer. Uh, it's, and it's, um, I think it's actually colored in here as the second to most dark category. There are some very small countries like uh, Liechtenstein and Monaco, uh, and Luxembourg that have uh, these super high population, and Singapore, for example, that have these super high population densities because they're basically cities that are countries. But Bangladesh has a very high population density in this arithmetic people per square kilometer measure. But that implies you would think that there's a lot of cities, and there are a lot of big cities in Bangladesh, but it might surprise you to learn that more than half of the population lives in a rural environment. So the massive population of Bangladesh, the well over 100 million people that live there, uh, are, are not entirely clustered in cities. There are some very large cities there because the population is massive, but the country is still a majority rural population. So not nearly as urban as a place like Canada with a very low population density. So my point being is that arithmetic density is fairly imprecise and not very useful about describing what a country is actually like. Another measure we can use here is what we call physiological density. And so physiology refers to human, human systems like uh, energy and health and that kind of thing. And so human physiology, in this case, physiological density is the number of people per square kilometer of farmland. This is measuring a little crudely, but 
much better than the arithmetic density measure. This is measuring a country's ability to feed itself. It's not telling us quite how productive the farmland is, so that's missing a little bit here, but we have an idea about how many people there are compared to farmland. Now, interestingly, again, some interesting uh, comparisons happen here. So Canada has a very high physiological density, that is a lot of people per area of farmland. These areas that have low physiological densities mean um, not very much farmland per person. So places like China and Egypt and uh, these countries in the Arabian Peninsula stand out as having a lot of people and not a lot of farmland. Now, some places probably won't surprise you, like so Oman and Yemen here uh, are well known as desert locations and extremely arid, so not a lot of farmland. Uh, but And then Egypt as well has just the Nile River and the Nile Delta as farmland and the rest of it is desert. So it doesn't surprise us that the relative ratio of people to farmland is quite high. But then places like China and Vietnam and the Philippines stand out here as places that we think of as having a lot of farmland, but in fact they have so many people that the ratio is quite high as well. So that's worth thinking about in terms of a country's ability to feed itself. That might affect its uh, sovereignty, that it might affect its, its willingness to engage in trade or willingness to, to uh, endure conflict with neighboring countries or on an international stage. Uh, and it's, it's an interesting measure to look at. Uh, the final measure here is a, is a very different measure than the other two we've talked about. This is a measure called agricultural density. And it's a little confusing because it sounds a lot like physiological density's definition of people per farmland. But instead of looking at the total number of people per area of farmland, the, uh, the and I, I'm sorry, I believe I, um, I, I might have said acres of farmland is per square kilometers in this case, but uh, we're, we're on the metric system here, which is, which is great. High time we, we went there. This measure, the agricultural density, is not a measure of a country's ability to feed itself. It's really a measure of economic development of a country. Because what happens as a country becomes more and more developed economically is we have more and more machinery and therefore fewer and fewer farmers with the same per, per amount of farmland. So what we're seeing here then is places like the U.S. and Canada have uh, really large farms with massive capital investments in machinery. And the same is true of a lot of places like Brazil and Russia, Kazakhstan, Australia. Other places have more farmers per machine, which means they ha usually have smaller farms. And or another variable can be that the type of farming they practice might be more labor intensive. So if you see here, for example, my mouse cursor is floating over Italy, and Italy has smaller fields, so it's harder to drive a, a big tractor through. Uh, and they also have more labor intensive agriculture. So things like grapes, for example, they don't make machines yet anyway to harvest grapes in bulk. So there's a lot more labor intensiveness involved in that form of agriculture than there are in some others. We also notice that countries that have less economic development, so Pakistan and in India, all the way down here through uh, Southeast Asia stand out as places where there's labor intensive agriculture, not because it couldn't be mechanized, but because it hasn't yet been mechanized. So that's another factor that we're seeing here. So it's an interesting map to look at. It doesn't tell us about the total number of people in a country uh, or their relationship with the farmland, but it does tell us about the status of agriculture in that country, about how labor-intensive the agriculture is or is not. In this case, the red colors corresponds to uh, more labor-intensive. We need to flash back really quick. There's a little section in the textbook about future population growth, and I already addressed this earlier because I thought it fit in really well to the talk of concerns about population growth. Our textbook is a little bit more equivocal than I would like it to be on this because it does the classic academic thing of, well, we can't predict the future and anything could happen. And uh, that's true, but then why do we even talk about the future at all? And the answer is because we can make predictions if things stay the same as they are, and we can be more intelligent if we predict things to happen in the future as we have observed them happening in the past. So yes, anything could happen. We could have some kind of a major world destabilizing event. We could have a disease outbreak that kills half the population. We could have a uh, 
uh, a miraculous breakthrough that encourages everyone to have larger families. What that would look like socially, I don't know, but anything hypothetically could happen. But looking at the present trends in the demographic transition around the world, we can see that there is some momentum right now in the total number of births um, taking place because women who were born in the last two to three decades are now coming into or into their childbearing years. They're having children. We know about how many children they will have based on the number of children they've already had. And that might change a little, but it's not going to change a lot. And so using that sort of current trend observation forecasting and then keeping the demographic transition model in mind, we can predict into the future with some idea of certainty. We don't know for sure, but some idea, some idea that we have some kind of a clue that world population will peak around 2100. And this is the middle estimate right here from the... Um, from the, the United Nations of around 10.9 billion. Now, when the UN made these projections, they also put a high fertility variant, which sort of assumed that, that none of the continuation of the demographic transition actually continued. So something happened to where high fertility countries continued to be high fertility, which is unlikely based on what we've seen so far. We've seen fertility rates dropping around the world. It's very, very rare for, for fertility rates to go up at all. And usually in response to something like a, a baby boom might happen after a, a prolonged war period or a pro prolonged financial recession, for example, people might have a, a pulse in starting their families where everyone decides this is a good time to have a, have a family. But those are usually very short-lived pulses or booms in population. Uh, we've never seen one sustained for longer than maybe half a decade or a decade at most. So... We have a pretty good idea then, and, and, and they do have a low fertility uh, uh, forecast as well that, that levels off somewhere closer to this nine and a half or a nine point something billion instead of close to 11 billion. Uh, but, but this is sort of a, an interesting thing to think about is that in 100, or not 100 years, in 80 years from now, we'll, we'll be about full uh, in terms of the number of people. And then we would expect following the dem demographic transition model for that to plateau and then start to slowly decline. Uh, and that would be in sometime in the 2100s, so outside of many of our lifetimes, but certainly not that long in terms of the, of the progress of human events. So uh, interesting to think about, interesting to, to, to look at. And what we're seeing here, the way we've predicted this growth is by looking at the growth rate. And what we've observed is that the growth rate went up really dramatically uh, into the 1960s and then started falling almost as dramatically and it's continuing to fall. We've seen some little um, tapers, like I, I mentioned, but it's, it's, it's continued to fall pretty, pretty steadily through this time, and we should expect it to um, continue falling based on what we've already observed. The next section, um, the last section of our textbook for Chapter 2, is about the, uh, the, the geography of, of uh, health, and uh, there's all kinds of names for this. People call it health geography or population health or um, uh, human ecology sometimes gets wrapped up as this idea of, of how well off or poorly off a, 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 a world's popula a, a region's popula population is doing in terms of health trends. Um, the general study of the um, causes of people's deaths at the population level is called epidemiology. Uh, and so you can, you can also use that at an individual level that we talk about about disease epidemiology all the time with respect to the causes of death um, at, a, at a population level. So when we look at population health, um, our, our last little section here is, is a nice one. It's uh, probably too short, but they didn't want to add another chapter, I suspect, so they shoehorned it in here with, with population. The thing I wanted to talk about that I think we missed a little bit of from the, uh, the rest of the chapter, it, and it's good to tie it to this, is when we talk about the demographic transition, this is a, a, a path of, of demographic change. And we think of it a little ethnocentrically maybe because countries here tend to look back at where they were and say this is progress, but we think of it as a progress a progression. And it, I would shy away from that attribution or that, that, uh, that description, except for when we talk about what stage one was like, 
Um, we're talking about a high birth rate, but we're also talking about a high death rate. And we tend to agree fairly culturally universally that uh, a high death rate is bad. You need to be a real edgelord to be out there saying, no, 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 this, these were the good old days. Uh, and estimates of, uh, of death rates were, um, were extremely high in, the, in, in children in particular. So if you look at historical estimates of death rates in the pre-industrial era, um, these, these are, th there's numerous accounts of, of how often kids were dying. Um, they are not all necessarily individually verifiable, but together they paint a really bleak picture. The estimates of child mortality from the pre-industrial era range from as low as 20%, um, maybe a little lower than that during times of extreme good fortune, to as high as 50% of all kids wouldn't live to their fifth birthday. So that is just shocking, uh, I hope, to, your, to our psyche, right? Um, and we tend to agree that that's bad. So then we say, well, what can we do to save those kids' lives? Well, we need to progress along the demographic transition because that's what we see as a process of a decreasing death rate. Now, countries that are in rapid growth have their own sets of problems, as we pointed out with the, um, the young age dependency ratio. And of course, we trade those for problems with the old age dependency ratio in, in countries in stage four and stage five. But uh, the countries here are low population and low wealth. The countries here in general are high population, but also much higher wealth. And so that problem of how to take care of all the old people is a problem, but we do generally see um, much more wealth in society. And then the problem is, solving, is being willing to pay for that care um, or having a mechanism by which to pay for it. So what I wanted to talk about with respect to disease re re geography here is that the causes of death change through each of these stages of the demographic transition. And some call it the epidemiologic transition because of that. But the things that are the major causes of death in stage one and into stage two are the kinds of things that are relatively easy to solve with even modest technology, much less advanced te technology. Things like uh, poor sanitation causing diarrheal illness that is com communicated by water. For example, cholera is one of these diseases. And um, diarrheal illness kills a ton of kids even today in the developing world because clean water isn't always available. Water is sometimes contaminated from poor sanitation and that's a major killer. Um, other diseases like um, smallpox and polio and and some of which we've we've eradicated almost on a global scale we, we still have little bits of polio popping back up here and there but it's uh, been largely contained around the globe um, they used to be far more common killers of uh, of people including young people and things like um, malaria for example so easily preventable um, and pandemic diseases were killing a lot of people in this era as we move into stage two, we start getting that under control. We start getting the first biggest causes of death a little under control, and that death rate starts plummeting. So these are uh, less and less of those easily preventable deaths are happening because we're preventing them. Then as we move into stage three, people have lived past the risk of getting cholera or malaria or um, polio We've been vaccinating. We have antibiotics to treat a lot of diseases. We have um, the knowledge of how to avoid catching the diseases or spreading the diseases. So we're controlling them. We're controlling those diseases relatively well. The things that start killing people in stage three then are the longer term degenerative diseases. This is what we think of as the kind of things that kill people in places like the United States too. Uh, things like heart disease, um, respiratory illnesses, long term um, uh, congestive. Um, heart disease and um, lung problems, um, stroke and the like, right? So things to do with the um, cardiovascular system, things to do with the um, with uh, respiration over long term. Um, cancer is a big killer of people in stage three as well. And that kind of thing, the things that we think of as things that happen to people later in life. So people are dying so young so often here, the life expectancy is low, 
as the death rate decreases, we start seeing people living much more often into their 50s and 60s and 70s, but then getting some kind of an older life, um, end of life degenerative disease and dying from that. What happens as we move into stage four and stage five is medical technology becomes advanced enough that not everybody, but a good number of people who get the diseases that would have ended their life in a stage three country end up surviving the first onset of those diseases. And so you probably have someone in your family uh, who has survived a heart attack or who has survived cancer. And in many cases, we have people who have survived a cancer or survived a heart attack living 10 or 20 or even more years longer uh, of, of their life um, after that first thing that would have killed them if they hadn't had as advanced medical care to solve the problem and repair their bodies and recover from that illness. So this stage uh, four, we see people living, uh, the life expectancies go into the upper 70s to young 80s in countries that are in stage four to stage five, because we're able to even, we're able to forestall those degenerative diseases even a little longer than we were in a stage three sort of um, country and economy. So I hope that helps sort of situate your brain in terms of where different countries are on this continuum. And then the point that our textbook makes in explaining that is by pointing out that there's um, really massive differences in, in uh, the, the prospects of life in different places in the, in the world. The most depressing st statistics, uh, of course, about this is the child mortality rate. Our book shows a infant mortality rate uh, map. The map of infant mortality and child mortality is very similar. Of course, infant mortality is deaths before age one. Uh, per 1,000 live births. Child mortality is deaths before age five per 1,000 live births. So they're all correlated because most child deaths take place in that zero to one age. The, the two to four, uh, age two to age five uh, window is less likely to have death. So, but the, the zero to five death rate is always higher than the zero to one death rate, but they're always correlated. So this map doesn't look very much different than an infant mortality map does. What we observe is that the countries that have the highest growth rates in terms of population also have the highest child mortality rates or infant mortality rates. So we see this cluster of countries here in Central Africa, especially through the Sahel region here, across to Somalia, and then down into Central Africa, have these really high child mortality rates. Other places that we think of as uh, pretty low developed status, like Afghanistan and Pakistan stand out as well. Uh, and then this, um, this is showing us um, actually the, um, sorry, I realized I just, I got, I got a map that shows us the information we need, um, but this is not actually the actual rate. This is showing us the, um, the, how high above the, um, the development goal from the UN each country is. Um, and so these countries are 100% over 25 per 1,000 live births or higher is what the, the, the deep red shows us is how far um, above that goal of 25 deaths per 1,000 each country is. Many countries in the world, of course, are below that 25 um, deaths per 1,000 live births already, um, but other countries are um, not going to make that target, it looks like. So that's worth thinking about. You can, you can do a Google map search for, um, you can do a Google image search for child mortality rate and get a map that shows you the actual rates. But this gives us the same information, but as a percentage of that millennium development goal. Let's move on here. The other contrast that the textbook gives that I put in the context of that uh, epidemiologic transition here is that we see uh, degenerative diseases like diabetes. And diabetes is something that people get generally later in life and uh, tends to be a risk to life later on. So this isn't something that kills babies or young children. This is something that kills um, adults or uh, limits their health, at least. What we observe is an interesting pattern right here, which is that this is something that is much more widespread among the countries that are wealthier. Not every country has a super high diabetes prevalence. And as a matter of fact, there are some sort of surprises here. So like Pakistan and Egypt, have super high rates of diabetes, whereas France and Ireland have relatively low. Uh, but what we tend to see is a pattern in which fairly wealthy countries where people can um, have relatively rich diets 
tend to be more prone to diabetes, whereas areas that are um, relatively poor and the diets are therefore simpler uh, tend to have lower incidence rates and prevalence rates of diabetes. The um, contrast to that is something like this map here of malaria. And what we see is that malaria is concentrated in the same countries that have that really high child mortality rate. And the message that I wanted to give here again is this, these stage two, maybe early stage three countries have unacceptably high death rates from fairly easily, easily preventable diseases. So malaria is something that happens to a lot of places where it's widespread and endemic, but you can treat it with medicine if you get it, as long as the medicine's available, and it's not available everywhere in these places where there's really high rates. And you can also even prevent people from getting it through really simple interventions like using bed nets uh, over, over beds at night because the mosquitoes that spread malaria only bite at night. Uh, and so the, the cost of a bed net is a few dollars and it can save, you know, one bed net could save uh, numerous cases of malaria uh, and can save lives as part of that. So the, the, the message here is not people die from different causes and that's too bad. The message here is people early, it's to countries early in the demographic transition are growing fast but don't have a lot of wealth and the causes of death are very easily preventable for a lot of the population. But because of the way the world is today, we don't have that distribution of resources. There's a lot of organizations working to try and solve these kind of problems, including a lot in the greater Seattle area. So if you're interested to learn more, I'm happy to talk with you about some ideas about how you can uh, either make a donation uh, to a, a worthy cause to try and, and help some of these numbers that we're looking at today. Uh, or maybe pursue a career in health and or development uh, to try and make the world a better place for everybody. That is all I have for you for this one. I hope it was uh, a, a good length, not too short, but uh, not but not way too long either, and full of full of interesting, if not fun, information <laughs> this time around. At least I hope it was uh, interesting and educational. Thanks so much. I'll talk to you all soon in Chapter 3.